Uh, we're talking about connected sets and um, I had maybe like 10, 15 minutes to do about connected sets and then we're gonna move on to something completely different. We're, we're pretty much done with our little um, unit on topology of the real numbers. Topology would include uh, open sets, closed sets, compact sets, connected sets, that kind of, uh, all that kind of stuff. Neighborhoods and limit points, all of that is generally like topological concepts. Um, so we were talking about connected sets last time. I will refresh your memory of the definition. The definition is not at all obvious. Um, I, we see E is connected. Actually, the definition is we define what it means to be disconnected first, and then you just say connected is the opposite, because it's actually easier to say what disconnected means. Disconnected uh, when you can write E equals A union B with A inter sorry A closure intersect B is the empty set and A intersect B closure is the empty set. All right. If you do that, those sets A and B, this uh, A union B is called a separation of E because you are expressing E as two separate parts. That's called a separation. So E is disconnected when there is a separation like this. And otherwise, if there's no separation, uh, it's called connected. So E is connected. Can I just say when it's not <coughs> disconnected? That is to say, uh, it's impossible to make that kind of separation. All right. Any, uh, this is the definition as we had from last time. So for example, how about, we did some interesting examples last time. How about uh, N? If I were to draw a picture, it you know looks like this. What do you say, connected or disconnected? Disconnected, yeah. Uh, would anybody uh, be able to tell me a separation? That is two sets. <coughs> where the union equals n, and they have those intersection properties up there. There are actually many ways to do this with n, but you have to come up with two sets which are cover all the natural numbers, but are kind of separate from each other. What do you think? Evens and odds? OK, sure. So let's say a is. 1, 3, 5, etc. And B is uh, 2, 4, 6. All right. So certainly it is true that N is the union, A union B. That is uh, the case. What about those closure things? A bar intersect B. What is A bar intersect B in this case? Um, can somebody say, what is A bar? So this is A, one, three, five. A bar is the closure. That means you take all of those things, plus also you take any limit points of those things, any, any other points that those are like uh, approaching in any kind of limit. Um, what, would that, what would that look like, the A bar here? The question in your mind should always be, is it just the same as A, or is there some extra stuff I have to add in because of the, the limits? What do you think? Yeah. It's just the same as A. Yeah, these points here, the, the odds, they don't actually approach anything in any kind of limit. You might say they go to infinity, but that, that doesn't count because uh, infinity is not a real number. So A bar is just the same as A. So this is 1, 3, 5, etc. Intersect B is 2, 4, 6, etc. And that's the empty set, right? There is no number which is in both of those sets. And what about A intersect B bar? Same deal, right? A intersect B bar. Again, B bar is the same as B. So this intersection is just the same as A intersect B. That is also the empty set. All right. So uh, that is a separation of N into the evens and the odds. Uh, there are many other ways you could have separated N. I would have actually, what I had written on my paper is different. Uh, you could, uh, I will just say, you could have done uh, A equals just one 
and then b equals everything else, 2, 3, all right? That also is a separation of n into two parts. And again, if you make those choices, the closures don't do anything because the closure of a bunch of individual points is the same set again. All right, great. I actually wanted to talk uh, for a moment about the closures. Why do we need the closures as part of this definition here? Um, the whole point of this is that E, you write as just like two separate parts. Isn't it just good enough to say A intersect B is, is empty? Like there's no overlap between the two parts? That's how I would say A intersect B is empty. There's, there's nothing in both A and B. Why is it necessary to also use the closure here? That's what I want to talk about. So um, it is actually necessary. So uh, sometimes, maybe I'll say it this way, it's possible that um, A intersect B is empty, but A closure intersect B is not empty. Like this is, this is uh, an important situation. Sometimes it can happen that the closure really does make a difference. Although in that example we just talked about, actually the closure had nothing to do with it. it didn't, the closure didn't matter. Um, and in many of the other, maybe all the other examples we've done, the closure didn't really matter. It, uh, but it is, there are some examples. Actually, it turns out we can, we can do, say, E equals A union B, even for something like E equals the closed interval zero to, maybe zero to two, how about that? Anybody see how, how can you do this? It is possible actually to write that as a union of two separate, uh, two sets which have no overlap. Let me see how, how that could be done. Break it into two pieces which do not uh, overlap with each other. We could do B equals A union B with an idea, yeah? Would be, so A would be uh, 0 to 1, 0 is closed, 1 is open. Okay. B is 1 to 2, all closed. Yeah, I like that. I hope you agree. Those are actually two pieces that make up the whole thing. And they, they do not have any intersection because there's no number that's in both A and B. And they do actually cover up the whole interval. So, you know, one of them is like this. And then the other one is like this, right? Of course, that shouldn't count as a separation because even though they don't, they don't overlap per se, they're like right next to each other, right? We need to disallow this kind of scenario. So this does not count as a separation. This is not a separation. Even though A intersect B is empty, there's nothing in both. This is not a separation since A closure intersect B, if I do the closure, it becomes 0, 1 closed intersect 1, 2 closed, which is just 1. And that's not the empty set, all right? So you really do need that closure business. It's important because if you don't, uh, if you don't consider the closures in there, you can get things which look like separations like this. Uh, really, without the closure there, any set becomes separable, uh, and that's not a useful concept, right? We're talking about connected sets is separations where the closures don't overlap with one another. All right, any questions about that? What are your questions about that? I heard a, I heard a teaching pro tip once. Somebody said, you should never say, are there any questions? You should say, what are your questions? Because I know you have questions and you're just too timid to say them. I guess that's the idea. I don't know. I hope that you feel free to say what your questions are. And I hope you also can live your truth. If you really have no questions, that's OK. Um, all right. So the closure business, that is an important part of the definition. It's not just like some extra technicality for just for fun. All right. One last thing I want to say about connected sets is the relationship between this weird definition in terms of separations, these closure things, and this is related to points being in between other points. It's something I mentioned last time, and I want to talk about the relationship. I'll write this as a theorem, although I, I don't want to do the, the full uh, proof of this. But 
this is this theorem is going to say basically this stuff about separations and the closures business that is equivalent to this the other uh, notion of connectedness that I said before about um, about points being in between so it says e is connected by what I what I mean by that is no separation if and only if uh, I'm going to say this other thing that I said last time, which is complicated to look at, but actually makes a lot of intuitive sense. Uh, if you have two points in the set, then all the points in between are also in the set. That's what connectedness is equivalent to. So I'm going to say um, if A and B are in E with A less than C less than B, then C is in E. So what the thing on the right-hand side says is if you ever have two points in your set, then any other point which is in between is also part of the set. That is equivalent to saying there is no separation, you know, E equals A union B with the, with the A closure intersect B is, not, is empty. All right, um, I want to talk about why this is the case. Uh, let's just do one of this, you know, this is a if and only if, so really it involves proving two separate directions. I just want to talk about one of them. Let's do the, the sort of forwards direction. That is, assume that E is connected. This one is actually fairly straightforward. If you draw some pictures and understand what's going on, then everything works out great. Assume E is connected. That is to say there is no separation of E. And we have to prove this stuff over here. We have to demonstrate that this stuff is true if E is connected. So in order to demonstrate this, this is a little if then. So I assume this stuff is true and then I prove this. So assume E is connected and I will say let A B in E with A less than C less than B then we'll show C is in E, all right? This is what we're trying to do here. We assume that E has no separation, and then we have to prove that this other number is in the set. So the idea here is we have, I'll try and draw a picture here. Our set E, I don't really know exactly what it looks like. It's connected though, so I drew it as if it looks connected, although that's what, what we're trying to show is if I have A and B is in E, let's say A is here and B is here, and then C is somewhere in the middle, and we have to prove that C is also part of the set uh, E. Now on the picture, it looks like obviously it is, but it's because I already drew the picture so that it looks connected. So um, we have to actually try and demonstrate that. This though, it turns out is, uh, is nice, it, this whole thing works out really nicely if you prove this by contradiction. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, for the sake of a contradiction, assume C is not in E. So we have to imagine this C somehow is like a, a hole in the set. There, there actually is no um, point there. Or, I mean, there's a point there, but it's not part of the set E. All right. And then we'll somehow derive a contradiction. Actually, we can show, just to give you a hint, um, we'll show that this uh, implies a separation of E. And maybe when I say that, it will become clear. Anybody have an idea? Once you believe that that, that point in the middle there, C, is not actually part of E, uh, anyone want to suggest a separation? Can I write, just sort of based on that picture here, E equals A union B? Can you split E into two parts, perhaps, using the fact that that C in the middle there is not actually part of E? What do you think? Yes. Yeah, this is great. I'm actually gonna I'm gonna modify this a little bit so this is not 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 exactly true, but this is the right idea. Uh, you basically split the thing into two parts, like this part and this part, right? The part which is to the right of C and the part which is to the left of C. 
Um, this, so one, one slight criticism is these things, when I take their union, they have to actually give me all the points from E. And it, it seems like that may not be the case in the, on the picture, at least like there are still some points to the right of B, uh, which you're gonna lose out on because your, your second set here only goes up to B. Anybody have a simple remedy to that? Yeah. Okay, this is a good idea. She said, instead of using B, use the largest element of E. What if E has no largest element? This could happen if, if it's unbounded or it could happen if it just goes, sort of has, it's missing its, its uppermost endpoint. There's an easy answer to this and a hard answer to this. The hard answer would be you could use something like the soup instead of the maximum, although there's a, an easier way to It's not enough to just put a B here because this, these two sets together, they're supposed to make up all of E. And so if you stop here, you're not going to get all the rest. Any? Yeah, how about we just put infinity here instead? It doesn't matter if you precisely stop at the very end, does it? You just got to make sure you get them all, right? So we can go over? Well, this is another issue. Um, actually, now... I got too much. A union B actually is supposed to equal this set E, but here I actually, A union B is really all real numbers except for C. So um, there's another simple fix to that though. Do you have an idea for this? This is actually a similar trick we did last time with the example with Q. Uh, yeah, we can just for each of these say intersect E. Now I feel perfectly good about this, all right? So what this says is this is just all the numbers from E that are less than C, and then this is all the numbers from E that are bigger than C, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, now we should verify that this really is a separation with, with those closure things, so let's just talk about what is then A closure intersect B. Uh, maybe we should talk separately about, like what is A closure? A closure, um, this is actually a little tricky to see uh, precisely, but because um, we haven't really talked about how does the closure play with intersections? So this is really this, the closure, like that, right? Um, can you do like, is that the same as the closure, the first thing? intersect the closure of the second thing? Actually, it is. This isn't something that we talked about, but would you mind if I just use this, this fact? This is a topological fact. Is that. So I took the closure of the one on the left and the closure of the other one. You might wonder, does, it, does that bar switch it to a union or something like that? It doesn't. Don't worry about it. Yes? Uh, this one? Yeah, it's because I did the closure. When you do the closure, it turns an open interval into a closed interval. And it turns, that's also why this E gets an E bar. It's the closure of E now, all right? So anyway, we, have, we now have A bar intersect B will be, it's this thing, minus infinity to C, closed interval, intersect E bar, and then intersect B, which is C to infinity intersect E, all right? But that's empty. Uh, in fact, these E's don't even matter. It's already empty because the intersection of this interval and this interval is the empty set. All of these intersections, it means all the numbers which are in all four of these sets. And there aren't even any numbers in these two sets. So this is the empty set. And the other way around, A intersect B bar, for similar reasons, is the empty set. All right, so this really is a separation. And this contradicts our assumption that E was connected, All right? If you're missing one of those points in between, then you can sort of stick your thumbs in that point and make a separation of the two, the set into two halves. All right, let me just, I will write down. So um, E is disconnected. And that's the contradiction with our assumption that it is connected, right? All right. And this is the end of what I wanted to say about
connected sets. Basically, this, this theorem here essentially means, this between this business here, uh, this essentially means that, I will say this a little informally. Actually, it's not informal. What I'm about to say is actually straight up true. Um, all connected sets of real numbers look like intervals because they are sets in which all the in-between points always have to be in there. And if you think about what, what kinds of sets are there in which all the in-between numbers are already, always in the set, there's, that's intervals. There are no other kinds of sets that have that property. So all connected sets of real numbers look like intervals. I mean, um, open or closed or like half if it's you know includes a point on one side but not the other all of those would be connected sets and nothing else is a connected set anything that's not that uh, sorry or technical technical exception or single points a single point by itself is connected and i suppose the empty set is connected but that's a, that's a stupid example no, the empty set is disconnected because you can say empty set equals empty set, union, empty set, and that's the separation of the empty set. That's, it's too stupid to talk about, but uh, yeah. All connected sets of real numbers, they're always going to be intervals or individual points, right? This is the moral of the story. Any thoughts about that? It means all this time I was talking about connected sets, I was just talking about intervals the whole time. And so this is a little unsatisfying to me. I don't know if you ever think this about me, but you might think, why did, why did we just spend two days talking about intervals the whole time? Why didn't you just say from the beginning, we're just gonna talk about intervals? Um, like, what we, sh we proved that Q is disconnected. Why is Q disconnected? The answer is, it's not an interval. The only things that are connected are, are intervals, really. Um, what's interesting about the, the separation, uh, the way of thinking about it in terms of separations, though, is, is very important in um, in other settings. So in just in the settings of the real numbers, it's not terribly interesting because it's all just intervals. But um, if you want to talk about connected sets in R2, for example, they can be much more complicated than just intervals. Like in R2, uh, intervals are like rectangular boxes or kind of like two-dimensional intervals. Um, there are many more types of connected sets in other dimensions or in other spaces entirely. All right, anyway, this is the end of topology uh, as we are going to discuss it. If you're interested in these concepts, you could take our, we have a course called Topology. Have any of you taken that? I think it's, you did? No. I think it's only offered every other year. And I believe, uh, I believe that I'm gonna teach it next semester. Um, I don't know if that makes you more or less interested, but uh, it's good stuff. I like Topology. All right. <laughs> This is the end of our topological discussion. Let's talk then for uh, really maybe the rest of the semester, we're going to be focused on functions. It's kind of remarkable. We've made it this far in the semester without ever talking about functions, but it's true. Um, functions, of course, are like important, right? Um, specifically, uh, our, our initial goal, at least, for talking about functions will be specifically, I want to talk about specifically something like this, limit as x goes to 2 of f of x, right? This is a kind of limit which eventually we will discuss in terms of a epsilon style uh, definition of what that limb means. But it is actually quite different from the limit of a sequence. Um, this is not, when I say this, this is not the same as the limit of a sequence. I'm really talking about sort of all x values around 2, whereas a limit of a sequence is like you have a sequence of terms which go out to infinity and you consider what do all the terms like towards the infinity end of that sequence look like. And it's really, uh, it's a different thing, although there is a similar style epsilon type definition for this. So I'll just say we're going to use epsilon type stuff for that. All right. Um, I thought maybe for our time today, our remaining 25 minutes, uh, I want to try to convince you that functions can be a lot weirder 
than perhaps you've been exposed to in your calculus class so far. And I have three examples of somewhat wild functions. Functions can be wild. B. Wild. Wild with a Y. That's extra wild. Functions can be wild sometimes. And the, um, the sort of original, the originators of calculus, I mean people like Newton and Leibniz, they really did not think about wild functions when they were doing this. So I will say maybe like pre, here's a very, very brief little history here. Pre-1800s, mathematicians such as they were, were all kind of mathematician, engineer, scientists anyway. There was not a, a clear delineation. But they really, um, they thought of functions, people thought of particular important functions. I imagine if you, if you asked Isaac Newton, if you just said, hey Isaac, um, just imagine a function in your mind. Probably he would imagine a, pol uh, a, a polynomial or maybe a trig function, sine or cosine, and maybe this is how we would all feel in our minds. There's a certain sort of bunch, bag of functions that you learn, like when you're a kid or something, and you gradually learn about more and more functions as you, as you grow and mature in life. But um, those are the functions that people really care about. Uh, I mean things like you know polynomials, trig functions, uh, logarithmic exponential functions, et cetera, right? Functions that sort of have names to them or functions that like there's a button on your calculator for that. Those are the kinds of functions that people always talked about. Um, and those kinds of functions, probably because they, they come from uh, making observations in the real world, these all tend to be um, continuous, maybe with a few isolated uh, discontinuities, like 1 over x is almost always continuous, it has that one point where it's not. Uh, these all tend to be continuous and differentiable, that is you can, you can take the derivative. All right. And so I think for that reason people didn't really consider what I would what I would think of as wild functions because they weren't just uh, they weren't the kind of thing that mathematicians like to think about the kinds of functions they like to think about are these ones that everybody's heard of um, the they all tend to be continuous and differentiable though that's kind of the downside because it these functions are all all these ones that you thought were like that's what all functions are that actually that's not what all functions are these are like the nicest functions ever. They are the ones which are smoothly differentiable and continuous all the time. Um, there are other functions which are much crazier. So I would say it's not until um, when we developed uh, set theory, when we got set theory, we uh, think of functions now, and this is how I would tip more, more typically think of a function. We think of functions as any rule giving, you know, answers from some domain. Right? In my mind, a function doesn't need, it doesn't have to have a formula to it, right? A function is just anything that you can describe as you tell me the x, I tell you what is the f of x. It doesn't have to be a combination of polynomials or whatever. Like, it could be anything. Um, and for this reason, uh, once set theory became popular, people started thinking about uh, what I would describe as very strange and wild functions. So here's my first example. I said I have three, three examples. This is Dirichlet, or Dirichlet, some people say. I, I spelled it wrong. There's an extra syllable. Dirichlet, like this. Come on. Dirichlet's function. 
This is a function that I imagine somebody like Isaac Newton would never have considered this function. Probably Newton, when seeing this, would say that's not even a function because it's too weird. Uh, here, here's what it is, though. Um, it is, this is a function, uh, I will say it's domain and range, first of all. It's r to r. Pretty much all the functions we're going to talk about are r to r. That means you plug a real number in, you get a real number as the answer. And it is this. It's defined in two pieces. One, if x is in q. Zero, if x is not in q. All right. This is a great example function. I really like this one myself. Um, one if x is in q, zero if x is not in q. Check it out, I'm gonna try and like, can we draw the graph of that? The short answer is no, not really, but we can, we can try at least. Um, the graph looks like if the number you plug in is rational, you get one. So that means, for instance, f of zero is one. f of one is one, f of a half is one, right? In fact, all the rational numbers go up here. So actually you get sort of a, a dense cloud of points up here. Every rational x value has the value one. And every irrational x value has the value zero. What that means is you get another dense cloud of points down here, right? So this is the graph of that function is kind of what it looks like. All right. If you ask a computer to graph this function, you will get, probably, you will get unsatisfying answers. The computer would probably say it's that because a computer, when you graph something on a computer, what it does is it, it just sort of uh, guesses a whole lot of points and sticks the dot where they go. But every, every point that a computer is gonna guess will be a rational number. And so it'll always put the dot up there, which is misleading because that's not what the real graph looks like, right? It looks like this. All right, uh, interesting facts about this one. F is, this is probably the simplest example of a nowhere continuous function. F is nowhere continuous. That is, every real number is a discontinuity point of this function. This is impossible to do with polynomials or something like that. You probably, like in your calculus class, it's a typical early, you know, early level calculus question, I show you a function and I say like, where is this function continuous? And your answer is always something like all real numbers except zero and two or whatever. Um, this is an example where it is, it is nowhere continuous. It's not continuous at any real number because nearby every individual point, um, like if I consider say right at zero, at zero the value of the function is at one, but there are values, there are other points sort of infinitely close to zero where the value is zero. So that means it's discontinuous at that uh, point. All right, nowhere continuous. Okay, that was the first wild example. Second one is just a, actually kind of a simple variation on that, but it's interesting to talk about. This one, as far as I know, doesn't really have a name. Very similar, but it's this. X, if X is in Q and zero, if x is not in q. All right, the graph looks similar, but not quite the same. Anyone think about this? Can you suggest what the, what's the difference in the graph of this one versus that one here? Yeah. Is it gonna have like, like different, like it's talking just yeah, this line will not be straight across. The reason this line was straight across is because of this one, this constant one. That's why it's a line straight across that one. So uh, can anyone predict what, what's it gonna look like instead? Yeah? Yeah, like the y equals x line, diagonally. But it won't be a solid line. It'll be this kind of like dense, <laughs> dense, uh, densely packed cloud of points. So yeah, this one will look like a whole bunch of points here. Those are the irrationals. And also this, <coughs> those are the rationals, all right? Very strange. Um, what's interesting about this one, and I'm sure you could think of many weird variations on this. You could like, for instance, instead of putting X here, you could put like sine of X, that would make this, this cloud go like that instead. Which, that might be cute, wouldn't it? Um, 
what about something interesting about this, about uh, continuity? Is this one also nowhere continuous? Um, actually, it is not. There is one point where it's continuous. Now that I say that, maybe you can say what it is. Zero, zero. yeah, it is continuous at zero because no matter where, at, as you approach this point, actually all the values do approach the same value, which is zero, all right? But uh, at any other point, there's kind of two different values that it's approaching simultaneously. So this one here, this one, this is continuous at x equals zero, discontinuous everywhere else. All right. These kinds of weird examples are among the things which finally convinced people that there really should be a better definition of continuity and limits, right? If you don't, if you don't truly understand what continuous means at a, at a fundamental level, it can be very difficult to, for instance, prove this fact. If you are a, a kid who thinks continuous means you can draw the line without lifting your pencil, that is just, that, that concept is not good enough to make arguments like this, because really, can you draw your line right there without lifting your pencil, but not anywhere else? I don't know. This, this lifting your pencil thing is not a good definition. That's what I'm trying to say. All right, one final example. We got 13 minutes. This one is the most complicated by far, but it's also my favorite. This is called um, this is called Tomei's function. I don't know if that's how you're supposed to pronounce this name. Tomei's function. All right. This one is really quite weird. It also involves a similar trick with like two cases, depending on whether it's in Q or not in Q. So it has sort of a, a weird cloud of points also. But this one is um, also takes into account, if it is in Q, that means you can write it as a fraction. And the definition of the function takes that into account. So here's the definition. F of x is one over n if x is in Q and x is m over n and zero otherwise. So this, what I mean by that is you write x as a reduced fraction. But in the definition here, you use only the denominator, right? You throw away the numerator. Or you, you just make the numerator equal one every time. You use only the denominator. All right, I would like to try to draw a graph of this. The graph doesn't look like a curve or anything like that, but uh, it is quite interesting to try to draw the graph. I hope everybody sees how you do this function. So if it's irrational, the answer is zero. If it's rational, you write it as a fraction, and you just take the denominator. All right, not so crazy an idea. It's a little weird. Anyway, uh, for example, um, can anyone say what is, say, f of a half? What do you say? It is a half, yeah. You take this fraction, and you change the numerator to a one. Well, it's already one, so this is a half. All right, how about f of uh, three halves? What do you say? Yeah, also a half, yeah. How about, um, let's talk about uh, f of, maybe I'll try, as, a, as I'm doing this, I'll try to draw a picture here. Um, <laughs> f of a half, I'll put one here. This is a half, this is three halves. So f of a half is a half. I'll put a, a nice looking point right there. F of three halves is also a half, all right. How about f of one? It's also one, yeah, you would write, write, the, uh, write one as a reduced fraction. It would be one over one. And then you only use the, you turn the numerator to one, it's one, all right. So this is one, like that. F of zero, I would say is kind of ambiguous because zero doesn't have a, um, a unique way of writing it as a fraction. Can we just not, let's just not talk about zero. Um, I really would like to focus only on this portion of the graph. So let's just look between zero and one. 
Um, what does that part of the graph look like? Uh, let's talk about the thirds. F of one third, that's one third, right? And F of two thirds is also one third. You always just take the numerator to be one. So this, I would look, uh, one third is around here, right? And two thirds is around here, something like that, all right? I'm just trying to fill in some rationals. What about fourths? I could do F of one fourth is one fourth. F of two fourths, actually that's a half, like two fourths is a half, so I get a half. I, I already put that dot on the graph. F of three fourths is one fourth. Okay, so when I draw in the fourths, they look like here is one fourth. One half is already there on the picture. There's that, all right? I'm getting some kind of a, I don't know, Christmas tree type shape, something like that. What about fifths? Uh, one-fifth, two-fifth, three-fifths, four-fifths, their y values will all be one-fifth, right? All of the fifths give me a fifth. So one-fifth is like here, I get one-fifth. Two-fifths is like there, three-fifths, four-fifths. The fifths don't go that way. Sorry, I'm not spacing them out properly. One-fifth, two-fifths should be like 0.4, all right. Then another fifth here, and another fifth here, right? The sixths, there are six different, or five different points, I guess, for sixths. Most of them give you one sixth, it's like here. We already did a third. We have one there, one there, uh, one there. Those are the sixths. Do you see the pattern? I don't know, it's a little confusing. I actually have a, a computer generated picture of this just so that my drawing is not, is not great. But uh, here is what it looks like. It looks kind of like that. So on this picture, come on now. So this point right here is a half, all right? And then all the other values go like that. Um, and all the irrationals go straight, straight to zero, right? Exactly zero. So I didn't draw them on this picture, but if I wanted to, all the irrationals, there's like a, a dense cloud of points which are exactly equal to zero right at the at the um, at the irrationals all right this is the graph of Tomei's function um, when is this continuous when is that function continuous could we say uh, for example is it continuous at the point we could ask like at individual points. Is it continuous here or there? Is it continuous at x equals one half, say? That's this point right there. Is it continuous there? Con now, I haven't given you the real epsilon's definition of continuous, but your idea of continuous should be um, all the points which are nearby, they go to the same, uh, the same y value. Is it true that all the nearby x values, they also go near one half? No, that's not true. Actually, the nearby x values seem to be going to zero something closer to zero. So it's not continuous here because this point is far away from the other nearby points which are going all down here. So is it continuous at x equal one half? No. Um, what about one third? That's this point. No, it's not continuous there either. How about a fourth? That's this point. No. How about like one, one over 10 would be maybe like one of these points over here. Is it continuous there? Now you gotta zoom in a bit, but actually that point, just like all the other ones, is far away from the nearby points because it's sitting here isolated. In fact, would you believe me if I said f of x is discontinuous at every rational, right? Because the rational values are the ones that make these like individual floating points. And those are all discontinuities. If you have an individual isolated point like that on a graph, it's not continuous there. Because that point is far away from the nearby points that are all down here, all right? So this function is discontinuous at every rational number. In fact, to me, at a casual glance, I would say this is discontinuous everywhere. Every point I can see here is, is sort of an isolated point all by itself, far away from the other nearby points. But this, my friends, 
is not true. Actually, this function is continuous at every rational. That's what's interesting about this. f of x is actually continuous at every, did I say rational? Irrational, that's what I meant to say. It is continuous at every irrational. What I mean by that is, I will say, i.e., f of, say, root 2 is 0. That's, that's true. That's easy to see by the definition. But it is also true that any rational number really close to root 2, its value is really close to 0. That's what the continuity means. f of root 2 is 0 and when, I'll say it this way, when x is really close to root 2, we get f of x really close to 0. It's a true fact. This is not obvious, but I I'm going to try to convince you in just a few moments. We've got four minutes remaining. Let's think about this. If x is really close to root 2, or you have to imagine x is uh, some number getting uh, closer and closer to root 2, this is what they say in the calculus class, when x gets closer and closer to root 2, then f of x gets closer and closer to 0. So root 2, I wrote down the decimal digits of root 2, 1.4142135, etc. All right? Um, can anyone imagine a rational number that's really close to root 2? Well, actually, if you can see these digits, then you can imagine. So a rational number really close to root 2 would be something like x equals, anyone have an idea? I said you can easily make a rational number if you see those digits. Okay, yeah. That's pretty close. I want it to be closer than that. Yeah, I mean, just use like all these digits, right? One point, that's why I wrote them all. 1.4142135, and then just stop right there, right? That's a rational number, which is really, really close to root two, okay? What is f of, is f of x close to zero? That's really what I want to know, because root two, when you plug it into the function, you get zero exactly. And what I'm trying to say is, all the nearby points, they also are close to zero. Is f of x actually close to zero? Um, what, what exactly is f of x in this case? That's rational. You write it as a fraction, and you make the numerator one. That's how you do this function. So how would I write this as a fraction? Well, it's this, 14142135.6 divided by this. Am I doing the right number of zeros? I don't know. Something like that though, right? This is what that fraction is. I think maybe, do I have an extra zero? Yes. No, that's right. All right. Now, this is not in lowest form. Remember the definition of Tolme's function is you write your fraction in lowest terms and then you change the numerator to a one. Um, I reduced this though on my uh, on my own time. This I decided is equal to this fraction. It reduces a little bit, although not a whole lot. Two eight two eight four two seven divided by two million. All right, that's a reduced fraction now. And so, f of x is one over two million, which is indeed close to zero. All right. The fact is, if you want to point very close to an irrational, you must use a giant denominator in its fraction. This is just a fact about irrationals. If you want a point that's very close to an irrational, its denominator must be huge. And so that means when you plug it into the function, its value will be close to zero. All right? That's why this function is continuous at all the irrationals, discontinuous at all the rationals. Very weird. Yeah, sure. All right. See y'all on.